Uh, there are certain moments in uh, life that leave an indelible mark. Uh, conversations, events, speeches that, that we hear we cannot forget. Why this event or that conversation impacts in a particular way is sometimes hard to explain. Well, in 1996, the science fiction blockbuster, Independence Day, starring Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum, where aliens invade the earth and threaten human extinction. The movie kind of builds this climatic fight scene when uh, the president, Bill Pullman, Thomas Whitmore in the movie, addresses the whole world through a radio and says that should we win the day, the 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as a day when the world will declare in one voice, we will not go silently into the night, we will not go down without a fight, we will live on, we will survive, for today we celebrate our Independence Day. Now, I have no idea why that speech has caused me to be remembered. I don't know why. Maybe it was I was a 16-year-old and I was hoping for the one day that I would help defeat an alien invasion. Um, but there have been countless times that we've been driving down the road and we'll hit traffic or some sort of difficulty in our own life and I will just start shouting to my wife, we will not go silently into the night. We will not go down without a fight. We will live on. We will survive. And my beloved Ellen will either roll her eyes or smile, depending on the moment. But the speech comes out. It has left its indelible mark. Another speech, however, has probably left an even more indelible mark on my life, my daily life as a pastor of the Park Baptist Church. Uh, Paul's farewell address to his dear friends, the beloved elders of Ephesus, has profoundly shaped my pastoral ministry. The speech continues to encourage and convict me whenever I consider the task of shepherding, as well as I, as I try to train others to shepherd God's people. For me, it is the, is the Mount Everest of pastoral instruction. So, beloved, if, if you want to pray for your pastors, this would be an excellent passage to pray over them. Uh, elders, if you want to shepherd well, this passage would be one that should be commit, committed to memory. Aspiring pastors and elders, if you want to know the who and the what of pastoral ministry, drink deeply from the well of Acts 20, 17 through 38. As a pastor, when, when I come to such an indelible text that has shaped me and touched me so deeply, I, I just want to do it justice. I, I looked at Pastor Victor this morning and I said, hey, pastor, do the text justice today. He kind of paused and said, how can we? <laughs> I don't know. I pray that the Holy Spirit would take this farewell speech and it would burn in our hearts that we will not go silently into the night, that we will not go down without a fight, that we will live on, that we will survive. For today, as every day, it is our dependence day. Hopefully that's not too cheesy. I think it probably was. <laughs> Let us depend upon the Lord's grace yet again to carry and sustain us in the grace that he has given us to receive the word with glad and sincere hearts this morning. When I preached this message for Witt's uh, ordination, I had 30 points that I preached in 29 minutes. Today, I merely want to give you four, four must-haves of pastoral ministry, and I assure you it will not be 29 minutes Paul hopes these four must-haves embody the elders of Ephesus, and I think embody the elders of all churches throughout all history. The first must-have of pastoral ministry is, one, a godly example, a godly example. Paul, if you remember, decided to sail past Ephesus because he did not want to spend a lot of time in Asia. He says he was hastening to go to Jerusalem. He arrived at Miletus and yet he had one more word to give to his disciples, one more word to give to these elders. So he sent word to the elders to, to come to him. Now, Miletus was about 62 miles from uh, Ephesus. This would have been probably a three-day walk. Paul called these el elders and they came. Look at verse 17. 
This is now from Miletus. He sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. Again, just notice the first, well, the New Testament pattern of church government. Uh, Paul calls the elders, plural, to the church, uh, of the church in Ephesus, singular. Uh, the New Testament pattern of every church would have a plurality of elder pastors to care for and watch out for the church, singular. It was never a put on one particular person, but on a, a group of godly men. He called and they came, and we look at ver- what happened in verse 18. When they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility, with all tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. As Paul begins his charge, he grounds his pastoral exhortation in his pastoral example. He begins, you yourselves know how I lived among you. Uh, See, Paul was confident in the example that he set before the Ephesians. Now, he was not boasting in himself, but he was boasting in the grace of God extended to him to live a holy and godly life. Now, Paul actually did this throughout his letters. We see this throughout his ministry. And so, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we read, I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of the ways, my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. He says the same thing twice, or maybe two or three times in the Thessalonians. Here's two. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the, the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. First, 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9, Paul says, for you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, Because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we did not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Philippians 3, 17, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Philippians 4, 9. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace would be with you. All throughout Paul's letters, Paul's saying, look at my life. Look at how I lived among you and follow my example. Those are strong words for any leader. But it's not just unique to Paul. Peter says the same thing and so did the author of Hebrews. So Peter writes in 1 Peter chapter 5, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Hebrews 13, 17, sorry, 13, 7. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. If we're going to teach others, whether as a pastor or a parent or any gospel practitioner, we must set a godly example for others to imitate. Since the church is called to imitate their leaders, every charge we see here in this passage in some ways is a call for you to imitate as well. I know a passage that is spoken to elders may cause some of us to check out. I'm saying, don't do that. Look at this passage and, 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 and learn for what God has for you. See, Paul was confident in the life that he lived before the Ephesians. Again, he's not confident in himself, but in God who worked in his life to live a life worthy of the gospel. Verse 19, look what it says. It says that he was serving the Lord with all humility and with 
tears and with the trial that happened to me through the plot of the Jews. See, his aim was to serve the Lord. He came with a, a specific mission of service to the Lord. And we see this in three specific ways. If it's true of the, of the Christian life, much more this is true of the, the pastoral ministry. We see this great mark of humility, the greatest mark, I believe, of the Christian life. If there is arrogance among the people of a congregation, there is likely arrogance among its leadership. Beloved, if we boast, we boast in the Lord. The gospel of the cross should remove all human boasting from our ministry. We have received our ministry by grace. You know, I love the way Tim Keller speaks of humility as, as self-forgetfulness. He says, humility is not thinking about yourself, thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself less. So humility is not thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself less. As pastors, we have to think more about the Lord and his people than ourselves. We have to be more concerned with what God thinks of us rather than when people think of us. So he served the Lord with all humility. We pray that that would mark every Christian in this church. But number two, he served with tears. The pastoral ministry is not merely a combination of tasks to perform, but it's a heart to be given. Not tasked to be formed, but a heart to be given. First Thessalonians 2.8, so being affectionately, affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Paul gave his life to the Ephesians. He labored for their souls with tears. True Pastoral ministry is a ministry of tears. I would say all true ministry is a ministry when we give ourselves, it's going to affect our emotions. It's wrapped up in a deep affection for the saints. You know, we want everything in our souls, in the deepest part of our body, that, that our people would be mature and happy in Christ. So we cry when people walk away from Jesus. Jesus. Yet we cry when people turn from their sin to Christ. We cry when people are sinned against and they feel the awfulness of this world. We cry for our people because we love our people. True pastoral ministry flows from a heart of love. 1 Timothy 1.5, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. So he served with humility, served with tears, but he also served the Lord through trials. You know, we already know from Acts 19 that some of the Jews were stubborn. They spoke evil of the way. They spoke evil of Paul and his, of the brethren. Other Jews in Paul's ministry incited riots, caused imprisonments, beatings, and a stoning. Beloved, do not be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you, that something strange were happening to you. For everyone who desires to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you desire to serve as a pastor, know this, you are inviting more suffering in your life. You will face more attacks from the evil one and from this world. You are inviting the, the trials of the people of God onto yourself. And yet Paul was confident in how he served the Lord in those three ways. You yourselves know how I lived among you. Let me double-click that last phrase, among you. Pastoral ministry is, is not only in the study. Listen, you have to study God's Word a lot if you're going to stand and proclaim the Word of God to God's people. It's not only in the study, but it is in the study. It's not only in the study, but it's in, in the lives of the people. Jesus came to live among us. And as his under-shepherds, we are called to do the same. We must know our flock. We must smell like our sheep. We must live among them. So elders, let me ask you, those who are here, are we setting a godly example for our people? Do they know us well enough to see our lives, to be able to imitate it? Or are we withholding that from them? Let us be, let's give our people a, an example worth following. So the first must-have of, of an elder pastor is, is a godly example. Now the second must have is godly exhortation. 
godly exhortation. The main distinction between a sheep and a shepherd in the church is the teaching and the overseeing of souls. Both pastor and people should be godly, holy, righteous, humble, forgiving, caring, compassionate. You don't have to have an office to be those things. You are a Christian. You've been dedicated uh, to Christ by the Holy Spirit, and you've been declared to live that way, okay? Paul did not merely want to set an example, but he wanted to set an example so that the message of the gospel would be heard and received by the people. Instruction best comes through relationship. Many of you have probably heard the statement, people do not know how much you care until they know how much you care. Did I say that right? I didn't say that right, did I? It didn't sound right out of my mouth. People do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. You've heard that statement before, right? (laughs) We may also add people who know how much you care will care how much you know, right? So if you know that people love you, you want to listen to what they have to tell you. The aim of a godly life is imitation and the transformation of others into the image of Christ by the word of God. So listen to the words related to exhortation and teaching in this this next section, Acts 20, 20 through 27. Just listen to the words of, of all the exhortation, the testifying and declaring that we see here. Paul writes, speaking to the church, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Holy Spirit, from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of among you whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of you all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Do you see how much is in there? Declaring, testifying, proclaiming. Paul built his ministry on teaching and preaching the whole counsel of God's word. He did not shrink back or withhold anything that was profitable or good for the people. He told them the whole truth. And he did it publicly and from house to house. So pastoral ministry is not merely the pulpit. Week in and week out, we are trying to build our church around the Word of God as we, someone stands and declares the Word. Now, I am not the only one who stands and declares. Many of our elders do. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to build the, this church on the Word of God, not on the personality of a pastor. We want the Word of God to be the center stage because he's the one that we're serving in no man. Okay? So we, we, the, the, the pastoral ministry is a preaching ministry. But it's not only a preaching ministry. We are called to, to stand week after week, open up God's Word for God's people. We stand under God's authority to declare and as the, the message of the king as heralds, the message of salvation. Now, I do not want to diminish the pulpit in any way, but the pulpit ministry is insufficient to complete the pastoral task. Let me say that again. I do not want to diminish the pulpit in any way, but the pulpit ministry is insufficient to complete the pastoral task. Paul says he preached publicly from a pulpit in front of large crowds and house to house. We take the Word of God into people's living rooms and kitchens. We share the Word on walks and car rides. We counsel the Word in offices and hospital rooms. We share the Word and the glories of salvation. We, we, we warn them of the wrath that is to come. We talk about the beauty of forgiveness and the terror of judgment. We must teach the whole Word to all of life in all of life. And Paul modeled a life of singular focus for the glory of God. He knew he was going to Jerusalem. I've said this before. And he knew that imprisonment and likely death awaited him. And yet he still went. Why? Look at verse 24. 
But I did not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Talk about a life verse, am I right? I just want to fight the good fight. I want to finish the race. I want to keep the faith. I want to please and honor King Jesus above all. My life is nothing, especially compared to the task that I have been given. I want to keep on testifying to the gospel of the grace of Almighty God. You know, pastoral ministry is hard. It is stressful. It comes with all sorts of unique challenges and stresses. Barna recently came out with a survey highlighting the high degree of pastoral burnout and the, and the stress among pastors. I was talking recently to a seminary administrator, and they said few, fewer and fewer men who go to seminary want to pursue pastoral ministry. Pastoral ministry is hard, but beloved, it is glorious. We get to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. We get to give our time to tell people that there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is forgiveness from sin. There is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And we get to speak of the grace of God again and again and again, and it never gets old. Friend, maybe you, you're here and you don't understand the grace of God. Maybe you don't even understand your need of it. The Bible says that we are all sinners and have fallen short of the glory of God, deserving damnation and hell because of our sin. See, God is an eternal God, and when we sin against an eternal God, the, the punishment must fit the crime. Do you see yourself as a sinner? Have you felt guilty, felt shame, or, or ever felt regret for things that you have done? All those emotions that stir up in you are pointing you to your need of God. It's the point to you that you have wronged God and that you need His grace. The gospel of grace says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We all deserve death, but God sent His Son, Jesus, to pay our penalty. He died in our place by taking full responsibility of our sin. Jesus stepped forward and said, I will pay their sin. And yet Jesus didn't only die. He was raised from the dead. He is alive. The grace of God says that even though you are a sinner and you deserve God right and just wrath, you can be made alive through repentance of sins and faith in Jesus Christ. The gospel of grace offers you eternal life today. Repent and believe. If you walked in this place outside the grace of God, trust me, anyone here would be happy to talk to you about the gospel of the grace of God. So here's a very simple question you can ask one of us after the service. Tell me more of the grace of God. We'd be happy to have that conversation with you. So when Paul compared the tears and the trials of ministry with the grace of God, it was a no-brainer. What a precious, precious gift to speak the gospel. You know, there are days when I may feel weary in pastoral labors, but when I think that I have the opportunity to share the grace and the gospel of mercy and forgiveness and hope to those who are far from God and to those who need to be reminded of it, I am strengthened for the task by His power that works within me. I, I pray that me, as well as all the other elders here, would, would be able to say that we would finish our course of the ministry that we have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. But not only elders, beloved, I pray that all of you, would, whatever ministry the Lord God has given you, you have received from his hand. We are all stewards of the gospel of grace. I pray that you would finish the race well. Let us be faithful to the ministry we have received from God. Paul told his friends, I'm never going to see you again. But I did not shrink back from telling you the whole counsel of God's word. I did not hide anything from you. I've told you everything that God has told me. I gave it to you. Therefore, I am innocent of the blood of you all. 
I have been a watchman when the, the enemy has been coming. I have declared and heralded, this is what's going to happen, and now I'm innocent and I am free. Beloved, you cannot make people turn to Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Salvation belongs to the Lord and the Lord alone. We plant and we water the seed of the gospel. We sow the seed and we leave the results to God. The third pastoral must have is a godly effort. It's a godly effort. So the, the first half of this sermon, Paul was really just reflecting on his own life. This is how I lived among you. This is what I did uh, before you. This is how I testify. This is how I, I, I plan to do that in Jerusalem. In, in verse 28, it, it, there's a shift that happens. Paul shifts the responsibility from himself to the Ephesian elders. We see a command, then a warning. Look at Acts 20, 28. This is the command. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. So this command to the elders to pay careful attention to themselves and to all the flock, and he calls them overseers here. In the New Testament, there's lots of different words used for pastors. The most common one is, is elder, presbyteros, where we get the Presbyterian uh, word from. Uh, or the one he uses here in this verse is episkopos, which is overseer. I don't normally share Greek words, but here's why I do it here, is because that second word, overseer, uh, is used to look intently. The, the root word is to look intently, and that, that epi is that, that intensifying uh, picture, um, that, that prefix. So Paul was charging the elders to pay, pay careful attention, to look intently at two things, their selves and the flock, okay? The first charges them to watch their own life and doctrine. The first calling, hear me, beloved, of any Christian is to care for their own soul. You can't give out to others what you do not have yourself. You must pay careful attention to your own soul. You must weed the garden of your own heart. You have to spend time with God in prayer. You have to study his word. You know, it's interesting here that about Paul, before he speaks about the dangers of false teachers or what's going to be coming, he stops and says, Pastor, Believer, Christian, take care of your own soul. You know, I've talked to lots of pastors all over, the, all over the world, and yes, usually the first question I ask them is, how are you doing? And they'll usually will say something generic like, fine. Then I'll look at them again and say, how are you doing with the Lord? And you'd be surprised at how often I hear, I'm really struggling to find time in the Word. I'm really struggling to find time in prayer. That's true of pastors, beloved. I know that's true of you. How are you doing with the Lord? Are you taking time to, to meditate on His grace? Are you praying to Him? Are you reading the Word? You know, we can get so caught up in the, in the busyness of life that we neglect to tend our souls. Now, you may be fine for a season. The times in my life, I have lots of words stored up in me uh, and because of that, I can, I can maybe last a while living in my own strength. But eventually you start crumbling. Friends, let me just tell you right now, if you're not in the Word, get in the Word. If you're not in prayer, get in prayer. And I would say, pastor, elder, your soul is precious to God. It was purchased by his own blood. The blood of the Lord Jesus died for your soul. He wants to have an intimate communion with you. And he wants you to have intimate communion with him. The only way you will be able to be sustained in pouring your life out to others is if God is being poured into you daily. You know, I always remark at the life of the Lord Jesus. How often does it say the Lord Jesus woke up early in the morning, went away to be alone with the Father? For the Lord Jesus, the incarnate God-man, had to get away and spend time with the Father. How much more should that be of us? Our flesh cannot produce spiritual fruit. We must watch our lives and our doctrines so that we can care for the sheep. But it also says, pay careful attention to all the flock. We are not called to look after only the old or the young, 
We're not called to care, pay careful attention only to the rich and not the poor. Uh, we must go after straying sheep, herding sheep, and lost sheep. We must strengthen and encourage growing sheep. You know, when I look at this verse, I see much good, much good that our elders are doing in this church. And yet I know there is much more we can do. I think of people, as I read this passage, who need better care. People who are straying, we've known they are straying, and we have neglected to go after them. God has given us sheep to watch out for, sheep he has purchased with his own blood. The text says the Holy Spirit has made us overseers of a particular flock. Jesus laid down his life for these sheep. So must we, for all the sheep. Richard Baxter, the author of the Reformed Pastor, uh, in his commentaries on this verse, Acts 20, 28, this is what he wrote. Oh, then, let us hear these arguments of Christ whenever we feel ourselves grow dull and careless. Let me just pause here for a moment. I think if you are a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have responsibilities to care for one another. So this could be applied easily to you. If you are a parent, this could be applied to you going after your children. If this is grandparents, if you going after their grandchildren, this could be applied to any one of us. When we think about what Christ has done for us, how he has obtained us with his own blood, this should be a charge to all of us. When I read this yesterday, I was gripped that I want to do better and more for the Lord. This is what he says again. Oh, then let us hear these arguments of Christ whenever we feel ourselves grow dull and careless. Did I die for them? And will not thou look after them? Were they worth my blood? And are they not worth thy labor? Did I come down from heaven to earth to seek and to save that which was lost? And will thou not go to the next door or street or village to seek them? How small is thy labor and condescension as to mine? I debase myself to this, but it is thy honor to be so employed. Have I done and suffered so much for their salvation? Was I willing to make, a, make thee a co-worker with me? Wilt thou refuse that little that lieth upon thy hands? When we look for what Christ has done for his sheep, we must give every effort to watch out for his souls. See, when I read this verse, I see so much here for the church and its membership. You know, God has designed the, the, sh the, the church to have shepherds and sheep, shepherds that care for the sheep. So in Acts 20, 28, this helps me happily recommend people who visit our church to other local bodies that may be a better fit for them. I did that this past week. Not that I don't want them to come here. I pray that they do. But at the end of the day, I don't want them to be here if God does not want them to be here. He, this, this verse helps me see that the Holy Spirit is the one who assigns people to particular fellowships. If the Holy Spirit leads someone here, then we have been charged by the Holy Spirit to care for their souls. They have been assigned to us to use their gifts for the building up of our body. And they have been assigned to us so that the, the gifts of our body would be able to care for their souls. You know, I and the elders here are not called to be everyone's shepherds, but we are called to shepherd those the Holy Spirit has made us overseers of. This also encourages church membership. You know, I know some of you here are not members of a local body, but just listen to what this passage is, is saying. God's design is for sheep to be under the protection of shepherds. When you decide not to join a church, some of you are looking, and that's not who I'm talking about. If you're like, the thing, I, I'm, I just don't think it's necessary for me to join a church. It's, 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 it's as if you're saying, I don't agree with God's plan. I don't need shepherds to watch out for myself. I'm good on my own. Now, there's words that I may, may, may attend to that, but I think at its core, maybe not, maybe not in an initial intent, there may be some pride there, and there may be some folly. It's prideful to say that we don't need help for any of us at any time. And I think it's foolish because we're refusing God's design for help. If God says, you need shepherds to care for you, well, then we should say, well, help me find shepherds to care for me. If this is what the Lord says that I need. 
It helps us tremendously as pastors to know who we care for. Do we care for only those who come to church on a Sunday, or do we care for those who have committed themselves to the body of believers here? And if you are a Christian and you want to be obedient to God's Word, how do you obey scriptures like Hebrews 13, 17? It holds a similar idea, but it's in the opposite direction. So Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders, elders, and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. So if you choose not to covenant with a body and not to be under the oversights of shepherds, who are your elders? Who are your leaders? Who are you submitting to? How do you obey them? And why would you not take God's help in the leaders that he's giving you for your own good? And I would just challenge you, if, if you're still not sure of church membership, look at the scripture and make an argument from the text why I don't need to be a member of a local body. Let me just encourage you that the local church is so precious. It is so precious to God that he sent his son to shed his blood for the church. And the sheep are so precious to God, the good and chief shepherd, that he left his under shepherds here to watch out for their souls. If you love Christ and his word, let me implore you to covenant with a body of believers to encourage and strengthen the saints as you're being cared for, Lord willing, by godly under shepherds of the Lord Jesus. Why? Why do I make this appeal? Because look at the text. There are wolves. There are wolves out there that are seeking to destroy the sheep. When you're under the care of shepherds in a sheepfold and you're not a, a lone sheep watering in the wilderness, you are much, much safer. These are not my words. These are words of the Apostle Paul. The last thing that he's going to tell his dear saints before he goes to die. I'm never going to see you again. This is the last I thing I have to tell you. This is all I got. Pay careful attention to yourself and to the flock. Care for the whole church of God because Jesus Christ purchased them with his own blood. Because, look at verse 29. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will rise up men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, second command, be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. And now I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. There is a steady and consistent warning in all the scriptures of a warning against false teachers. So on the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Hear me. Our main concern as a church is not the ideology of a secular world. Our main concern is not the ideology of a secular world. We know where the world stands. As one writer has said, Paul was not concerned with sheep dressed in wolves' clothing, but wolves dressed as sheep. We should not be overly concerned with the world and their ideas, but only if the worldly ideas and the philosophies and the ideologies of our age are promoted and highlighted in the church. Paul warned the church day and night through tears about the dangers of false teachers. He warned them to be alert, to be aware of those who come in the name of Christ, and yet doctrine is twisted. The job of a pastor elder is to protect the flock, to teach the truth, and to refute those who contradict it. To, to, to speak about to those who, who, who claim to be part of the flock and yet teach or practice things that do not accord to godliness. This task never ends. The task of shepherding the flock of God in the truth will remain until the Lord returns. We must be vigilant. Scripture will always be under attack. There will be some well-meaning 
Christian teachers. Beloved, I think there are lots of well-meaning Christian teachers out there. Like, they're not bad people under the, you know, depravity. Okay, we got that. But at their core, they're just people who want to help others. I think there's a lot of well-meaning Christian teachers. They aim to serve people. I really genuinely think they do. But I think ultimately they lead people away from the truth. As Paul warned Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, for the, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Let me just say this, beloved. There are churches that I know today that are drifting into a hard, right um, view of the truth and thinks their pastor is too liberal and have forced them out. So I think what this text is saying, there, there are churches that are accumulating teachers for themselves to suit their own passions, whether their passions are far right or whether their passions are far left. I, I, I see it in both places. We, as in our flesh, want people to speak to our passions rather than the Word of God. We here want to speak to the Word of God and not our passions. This is one of the reasons why we work verse by verse, book by book, why we want God's Word to be the main voice of our sanctuary. We don't want our hobby horses or our opinions to make too much of a way into our sermons. This will take godly effort. You know, one of the greatest gifts our church has been given has been the people of our church and the elders who care for them. By God's grace, our church loves the truth, and does not desire to wander off into myths. We want to hold fast to the Word of God. And I'm grateful to serve alongside other elders who deeply desire God's Word and, and want it to, be, uh, to infiltrate every aspect of our church's uh, ministry. But the strength does not come from us, but from God. Look at verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The good work that God has begun, he will carry on to the completion to the day of Christ Jesus. He has promised you an inheritance, and he will hold you fast. Whatever he has called you to, he will build you up and equip you to accomplish. So Paul turns again to himself and his testimony among them. Look at highlighting one of the greatest dangers of those in leadership, uh, money. Look at verses 33. I coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands minister to my, my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. He is not asking the elders to do anything he himself is not willing to do. There's a danger in working in an unbalanced way. But listen, the work of the ministry is hard work. It requires much labor and much effort. It requires Holy Spirit-empowered labor. It requires all of us to remember it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is probably a statement shared by Jesus during his earthly ministry, passed down orally generation after generation. It wasn't written in the Gospels, but we hear John's words in John 21. There are many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written, I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. We don't have all the words of, of Jesus, uh, the things he did, but what we do have is sufficient to believe that he is the Son of God and believing we may have life in his, in his name. So there's three must-haves I've already given you. Uh, we must, must have of a godly example, godly exhortation, and a godly effort. Lastly, we see these godly emotions. We really have seen that kind of woven through the whole entire passage. You know, Paul spent years with the Ephesian elders. He prayed with them. He did ministry together. He taught the truth together. He fought off wolves together. And this was the last time they were together. I hope you can sense the emotion in this passage. Verse 36, after 
And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So many emotions in that moment. Tears of sorrow and sadness, tears of weeping. All goodbyes are sad. Many parents over the last several weeks dropped their children off at college for the first time. (laughs) And there was much weeping on a part of all. There's always sorrow in goodbyes. But there's also hope in return. Paul's speech ended in sorrow because they knew that they would not see him again. But there's another farewell speech that did not focus merely on the, on the parting, but what the parting accomplished. The greatest farewell address ever written, ever spoken, was given by the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Olives before his crucifixion. He looked at his disciples and said, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming that I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day, you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone. The Father is with me. I have said these things to you that in me you might have peace. In the world you will face tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world we will have tribulation, but beloved, take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. Jesus went to the cross. He went to the grave. But praise be to God, Jesus has overcome the world. He is risen. He is alive today, interceding before the Father on our behalf. And he will come again. Friends, Paul knelt with the elders praying, knowing that he would not see their face again in this life. But he knew he would see their faces in the life that was to come because he believed in the gospel of grace. He believed in the gospel of the resurrection. He believed in the hope of heaven. So when he wrote Acts 20, 24, I do not account my life of any value or precious to myself. If only, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And we have Paul's last written words near the end of his life, right before he died a martyr's death. He says, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come, but I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. But not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. In his last words, the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. God strengthened his servant to finish the course and to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. I pray his final word would have an indelible mark on your soul. May the Lord be with your spirit and may the grace of God be with you. In this life, you will face tribulation. But take heart. Jesus has overcome the world. Father, we thank you for sending the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the grace that he's offered us in Christ. We thank you that you have raised up countless men to herald your gospel throughout the the ages, to testify to the gospel of grace. We pray that I would always be true here. We pray for all the men and women, the boys and girls here, We pray, God, that you would make them mature in Christ, that you would help them rejoice in the gospel. I commend them to you 
the gospel of grace, that you would build them up and strengthen them for the days ahead, that they would take heart that you have overcome the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, as always, good